Hey, I'm James, and today I'm going to discuss the blood supply to the brain. Firstly, I will describe where the arteries arise from and how they reach the cranial vaults. From then on, I will talk about the anterior and posterior circulation, the associated main branches, and their territories. Check out the fantastic articles on the Geeky Medics website to get more information on the blood supply to the brain and to understand stroke classification. Subscribe to Geeky Medics to be the first to know when we release new videos. The arterial supply to the brain comes from two paired arteries, the internal carotid and the vertebral arteries. Each of these arteries has quite a long course as they extend rostrally to the cranial vault. So let's start with the course of the internal carotid arteries. For these arteries, we must start in the thorax and focus on the aortic arch. The first branch is the brachiocephalic trunk. This artery courses towards the right upper limb, as we can see, and divides into the right subclavian and the right common carotid artery. The right common carotid artery ascends on the right hand side of the neck. The left common carotid artery arises directly from the arch of the aorta and ascends on the left hand side of the neck. The common carotid arteries pass within the carotid sheaths. At approximately vertebral level C4, the common carotid artery bifurcates into the internal carotid artery, which is highlighted here, and the external carotid artery, which we can see here. The external carotid artery goes on to supply the face and the scalp, whereas the internal carotid artery will continue to the base of the skull. Remember, the internal carotid artery does not give any branches to supply the neck, face or scalp, and so this is how you should distinguish it from the external carotid artery. The vertebral arteries arise from the subclavian artery, as we can see. These arteries ascend the neck by passing within the transverse foramina of the cervical vertebra. On this screen, I have faded the mandible, the sphenoid bone, and the temporal bone, so that we can see the course of the right internal carotid artery as it passes within the cranial vault. The internal carotid artery enters into the cranial vault by passing through the carotid canal and the upper portion of the foramen lacerum. The arterial supply to the brain article on the Geeky Medics website provides some extra detail on how the internal carotid artery looks on an angiogram. It may be useful to compare the model and the angiogram so that you can appreciate the tortuous route the artery takes as it passes through the base of the skull. I will rotate the model to look at the base of the skull so that I can show how each of the arteries enter the cranial vault. As I said before, the internal carotid artery passes through a portion of the petrous temporal bone, named the carotid canal. The artery will then enter into the cranial vault through the upper portion of the foramen lacerum. The vertebral arteries pass into the cranial vault via the foramen magnum, as we can see here on the model. So from this point onwards, I'm going to describe their posterior and anterior circulation and the associated branches. The vertebral arteries and the associated branches form the posterior circulation. As the vertebral arteries pass through the foramen magnum, they give rise to the posterior inferior cerebellar arteries and the small anterior spinal artery, which we can see. The posterior inferior cerebellar arteries supply the inferior surfaces of the posterior lobe of the cerebellum. The paired posterior spinal arteries, which we can see here and here, usually arise from the posterior inferior cerebellar arteries. At the medulla, the vertebral arteries unite to form the basilar artery, which extends towards the midbrain on the ventral surface of the brainstem. Key branches of the basilar artery include the large anterior inferior cerebellar arteries and the small pontine arteries, which we can see on the surface of the pons. The anterior inferior cerebellar arteries primarily supply the superior portion of the posterior lobe of the cerebellum. The multiple pontine arteries supply the pons. Two paired arteries arise at the terminus of the basilar artery, those being the superior cerebellar arteries and the posterior cerebral arteries. The superior cerebellar arteries supply the anterior lobe of the cerebellum. I will discuss the territories of the posterior cerebral artery with the other cerebral arteries later on in this video. The internal carotid arteries and the associated branches form the anterior circulation. There are a number of important arteries that arise from the internal carotid arteries, but the key ones that I will focus on are the anterior and middle cerebral arteries. The anterior cerebral arteries extend within the longitudinal fissure. 
The middle cerebral artery is the largest and most direct branch of the internal carotid artery. It passes laterally within the lateral fissure to reach the cortex. The territories of these vessels will be described later in this video. The internal carotid and vertebral arterial systems anastomose around the optic chiasma and the infundibulum of the pituitary stalk here. This creates the cerebral arterial circle of Willis, as we can see. The circle is completed by anterior and posterior communicating arteries that allow for equalization of blood flow. The anastomotic circulation formed by the arterial circle may be beneficial in the event of arterial occlusion, though this is not always effective due to the small size of these vessels. So I'm now going to describe the course and territories of the cerebral arteries. Knowledge of these arteries are really important for understanding stroke classification. So let's have a look at the course of the middle cerebral artery. As I said before, it is the largest and most direct branch of the internal carotid artery. The middle cerebral artery passes deep within the lateral fissure, and here, some small arteries, known as the lenticular striate arteries, arise. These small arteries supply structures associated with the basal ganglia, which are included here on the model, as well as the internal capsule. Damage to these small vessels can result in motor, sensory, or mixed motor and sensory symptoms. It is also important to remember that branches from the anterior and posterior cerebral arteries, as well as the internal carotid artery, also supply these deep structures. When we add the cerebrum back to the model, we can see the extent of the territory of the middle cerebral artery. The middle cerebral artery reaches the lateral surface of the cortex via the lateral fissure of Sylvian here. And as you can see, the associated branches ramify over the majority of the lateral surface of the cortex. This cortical distribution includes the motor and sensory areas to the opposite side of the body, excluding the cortical areas associated with the lower limb. The middle cerebral artery also supplies the auditory and speech areas. The anterior cerebral arteries pass within the longitudinal fissure and then arch back to follow the curve of the genu of the corpus callosum and the cingulate gyrus to extend as far back as the parietal occipital sulcus, as we can see here. It therefore supplies the midline surface of the cortex, including areas such as the orbital surface of the frontal lobe, the cingulate gyrus, and the motor and sensory cortices specific to the contralateral lower limb. The superior border of the distribution of the anterior cerebral artery meets the territory of the middle cerebral artery. Although it is possible that anastomoses exist here, it is unlikely that these connections would be sufficient to compensate for any interruption in blood supply. The posterior cerebral artery passes posteriorly around the cerebral peduncle to supply the inforomedial surfaces of the temporal and occipital lobes. The posterior cerebral artery supplies the visual area of the opposite visual field. Its territory meets that of the anterior cerebral artery at the parietal occipital sulcus. However, once again, any anastomoses are unlikely to be sufficient to compensate for any interruption in blood supply. So let's summarize. The internal carotid and vertebral arteries supply the brain. The vertebral arteries form the posterior circulation and supply structures like the cerebellum, brainstem, and posterior cerebrum. The internal carotid arteries form the anterior circulation and supplies the anterior and lateral aspects of the cerebrum. Both the anterior and posterior circulation meet at the optic chiasma to form the cerebral arterial circle. We'd love to hear your feedback on what you thought of this video and what topics you'd like us to cover in the future. You can do this by leaving a comment or dropping us an email.